Hi, everyone. Can everybody sit down and we'll get started? Good evening. It's good to have everybody here on Alumni Weekend, and uh, it's good to see um, future alumni, aka students, here. My name is Bill Gruskin. I'm the academic dean at Columbia Journalism School, and it's my uh, real pleasure. Introducers always say it's my pleasure to introduce somebody, but this really is my pleasure to, to introduce your speaker for tonight. And I'm going to go back about 10 years to an anecdote. Uh, the year was, I think, around 2003, and I was uh, at the time managing editor of the Wall Street Journal online. And our website had a design that we had inherited from the 1990s, and it really looked like it. It was really old and antiquated. So we brought in one of the world's top news design experts, Mario Garcia, to help us do something different. And I'll never forget that first meeting. He was at the head of the table, and surrounding him were me and about 12 other people from the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones, both the news and the business side. And Mario looked at us, and in his impeccable air of authority, he sat back and asked, if WSJ.com could be an animal, what sort of animal would it be? So a lot of us looked at each other. We were very puzzled. We didn't really know what to make of this. No designer had ever asked any kind of question like that before. And none of us wanted to be the first to respond. So there was a moment of silence, and Mario asked again, come on, if WSJ.com could be an animal, what kind of animal would it be? Maybe a jaguar. Perhaps it would be a gazelle. Finally, one of our developers who had long been frustrated at the glacial pace of technology at Dow Jones said, it could be a tortoise or a snail. <laughs> we all laughed, and we were, relie we were relieved that one of us had broken the ice. Then we went on to have a two-and-a-half-hour fascinating discussion about what the site was and what we wanted it to be. We had never been in a room with somebody who had so much expertise in design, yet whose values were so rooted in editorial and journalism. And sure enough, after a few months and many more productive meetings with Mario and, and, and his people, we had a much sleeker, much more responsive website, much more like, well, I guess a Jaguar. So I'm pleased tonight, more than a decade later, that uh, Mario and I are back together again. He and I got back in touch with each other about a year ago as we were interested in having him come teach our students. Unfortunately, he had some, some space in his very busy schedule. Mario has devoted more than 40 years to redesigning publications and has personally collaborated with over 700, that's right, 700 news organizations in, in pretty much every corner of, of, of the earth. From such large projects as the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, or the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, to smaller newspapers like the Charlotte Observer, or the Gothenburg's Posten in Sweden, to really small papers like the Lawrence, Kansas Journal World, and the weekly oil newsletter Upstream from Norway, all these projects have commanded the attention and special touch that is the Mario trademark. This year, we were pleased to appoint Mario as the Hearst Digital Media Professional in Residence. His responsibilities have included teaching a brand new class in multi-platform storytelling, delivering this lecture that you'll hear tonight, as well as another one to the students earlier in January, and best of all, sharing his wisdom with the faculty, students, and staff here at Columbia Journalism School. Mario, who is a native of Cuba, likes to tell people that he is first and foremost a teacher, and what a teacher he is. He started teaching as a journalism professor at his alma mater, Miami-Dade Community College. From there, he became a pro professor of graphic arts at Syracuse, Syracuse's Newhouse School, and then the University of South Florida. He's also been a distinguished professor at the University of Navarra in Spain, as well as a, as a lecturer at universities in 25 countries in North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. He's received over 300 Society of Newspaper Design Awards, including the Society's Lifetime Achievement. People Magazine and Español selected Mario as among the 100 most influential Hispanics. He, he was a recipient of the University of Missouri School of Journalism's Medal of Honor for Distinguished Service. And he's written more than a dozen books, including his most recent and his first digital book, iPad Design, Storytelling in the Age of the Tablet. Mario likes to say that, quote, these are the best times to be a storyteller because we can tell stories across platforms, emphasizing the, the uniqueness of each. And so it is with great pride and a warm amparazo that I want to welcome that jaguar of the news design world, Mario Garcia, to speak to you tonight. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I am honored to be here. I am 
enjoying my time at uh, Columbia tremendously, and uh, it's been a, a wonderful semester so far, and uh, we still have a few weeks left. Before I go into my presentation, I have the pleasure tonight of presenting the 2014 Innovator Award created in 2011 to recognize an alumnus or alumna for inspiring, creating, developing, and implementing new ideas that further the cost of journalism. The recipient of this year's Innovator Award is Shane Snow. Shane is a journalist and entrepreneur, a 2010 graduate of Columbia Journalism School. He is the co-founder and chief creative officer of Contently, a technology company whose mission is to build a better media world. Since his launch in 2010, Contently has raised more than 11 million in venture capital, grown to 35 employees, and provided career building tools for more than 30,000 freelance writers. Shane writes regularly for Wired Magazine and Fast Company. And his work has appeared in the Washington Post, Time, and Advertising Age. Shane, will you please come up to accept your award? Uh, just to say a few words, thank you, Mario, and uh, thank you. Uh, I, five years ago, was sitting in this lecture hall listening to the founder of BuzzFeed talk about how he had just invented this thing called BuzzFeed, and uh, a few weeks later, I got a text from the dean, uh, Sri Srinivasan, saying the founders of Tumblr are in my office and no one has come to see them. Do you want to come and hang out? And, uh, and I remember experiences like that. Uh, Throughout my experience at, at the J School, I came here having hardly written a piece of journalism, uh, but had a, having a deep interest in technology and wanting to do something with both. And, uh, and I guess I wouldn't be working on the things that I'm working on had I not had these experiences of meeting amazing people who have gone and built uh, amazing companies uh, in journalism. And so uh, I feel like I hardly deserve uh, to receive such an award just a few years later um, because it's all of the work that's going on here that is actually furthering all of this. So just wanted to say thank you and uh, yeah, I look forward to the lecture. Congratulations. So now uh, we're going to turn our attention to uh, um, this idea of two tempos, rhythms for storytelling in the digital age. Um, as I prepare for, for this presentation, uh, the idea, uh, at the beginning there were like nine or ten ideas floating, and that's how you begin to do one of these things, and eventually you have to curate. And I figured that if we concentrated on, on fewer ideas, but very robust ideas, it would be better. So I want to take you on a little journey of the news cycle and how it's changed. Uh, the news cycle a few years ago, the news always ran on, on a schedule. We read the morning newspaper as a part of our breakfast ritual. Uh, we listened to radio in the car. We seldom miss Walter Cronkite at 6 p.m. If we were late to bed, we could probably catch the 11 o'clock news. So there were these cycles going on. In between, the news largely, largely left us, except for emergencies. If there was something happening, you would probably get a Western Union telegram. Technology definitely limited the pace of news. If it had been up to editors, we had been constantly updated. Editors always wanted to do that. Uh, technology did not allow it. So when printing a newspaper on a mass scale, for example, you could not update an edition every five minutes to accommodate the latest news. Most news sources appeared in regular editions, allowing for intensive editing and eventually for art direction. Not so today. What is this, the news cycle now? It all began to change in 1991 with the arrival of the World Wide Web. And today, and this is one of the foundations of my work, we live in a world of the media quartet. Soon it might be a quintet. Heaven knows how many we will have two years from now. But right now, not only the audience, but the practitioners deal with what I call the media quartet, which is basically the phone, the tablet, the online edition, and print. And print is not going to disappear. Print will continue to be here. But we are connected and addicted. And the more pings we get, the happier we seem to be. We are in a world where if someone doesn't get a text message for maybe 10 minutes, they believe the world doesn't love them anymore. 
And, and so it is the same for our obsession with being informed. We always believe that we don't know everything that's going on. And today is just as easy to put out a tweet about breaking news as it is a massive year-long investigative report. Both appear instantaneously at the click of the submit button. If the default then was an edited package of news at a specific time, the default today is a second by second update. It's right now, I want it right now, give it to me right now. So the basic idea in this lecture is that we survive, we live and thrive in two tempos. The 24 seven, the constant flow of information that we continue to desire and the curated edited and art directed packages. For many journalists of my generation who are still working in newsrooms, this is very difficult to understand, that you must take care of these two tracks that are running parallel to each other. The one track of that constant flow of information, and then two or three times a day, we want the world to stop and someone to reassure us, sort of like give us a teddy bear that says, okay, these are the three stories. If you really are insecure about how much you know, these are three stories that we've curated for you. Hug your teddy bear, the world is okay, and the constant flow continues. And then maybe by lunchtime, again, you feel like, what have I missed? And there is an angel there, an editor, who's curated four or five stories, two or three photos for you. And if you are not doing this, you are going to fail your audience, no matter how you look at it. I equate it to what I call, and I tell my students, is the harbor light theory. If you know about harbor lights, they're constantly going around. That's the 24 seven. But that harbor light has the ability at any point to stop if you wanna zero in on that cathedral over there or that hotel over there. And that is how I see it. The constant flow and then stop. And that stop is coming two or three times a day. There is a desire for that early in the morning, a desire for that in the middle of the day, and just around six o'clock in the evening. For the world to stop and this to have a beginning and an end. It's like when you end your workout, you're very happy when the machine says your 30 minutes are up, you've done it, congratulations. We want this constant flow to be there, but we want it to stop. And so most media organizations thrive on the media quartet, on the fact that it's news when you want it, how you want it, and in terms of marketing, I always advise my clients, do not promote one of your platforms only. Tell the world that you have the phone, the tablet, the online, and the print, and whatever comes next. It is basically, another uh, analogy that I use is the raw meat and the cooked meat. In the mobile units, you're throwing raw meat to the lions in the cage you will cook it later. In the lean back, you're gonna cook that steak to perfection. But I am of a generation where we always cook the steak to perfection before we served it. I remember Journalism 101, because I'm 67 years old. So you can imagine when I took Journalism 101, Gutenberg was around. And, <laughs> you know, and they will tell you, you don't go with the story until you have all the facts. Today, I imagine that in Journalism 101, they tell you, you go with what you have and you perfect along the way. So the beginning is basically raw meat. Three lines, it's a tweet. And two minutes later, you know a little bit more. By tonight, in your tablet, you have the cooked steak and the two have to go hand in hand. You have to be able to serve this and serve that and whatever comes in between. So there is an increasing appreciation for the role both tempos can play in a news organization's offerings. And we're gonna examine now the legacy and startup news organization doing interesting work in what I'm talking about. In the 24 seven, the constant flow, the harbor light, you are dealing with inter the journalism of interruptions and everywhereness. The people reading you on these mobile devices are constantly interrupted because they get a message. Oh, you have a message on Facebook, you have an email, and they go back and forth. What does that mean in terms of writing? Shorter paragraphs do better than longer paragraphs because if I'm interrupted in the middle of a long paragraph, it's more difficult for me to continue. Subheads in between are great navigational devices. If you have a subhead in the middle of a story, 
that says, what next for Hillary? But you have been interrupted by a message. Coming back to that is much better than in the middle of a long story that is not broken up. So this affects reporters. The whole idea of interruptions and every awareness. Speed with accuracy. Short over long in the mobile devices. Facts more than analysis. The analysis will come later when you serve me the cooked steak. So breaking news is one of the first that I would like to profile here. It curates the latest pieces of news around the world, and it provides very brief and fast updates. They combine updates into topics, allowing users to be alerted to updates on their favorite topics or mute those they are not interested in. So the creators came to the conclusion that focusing on the consumer goal of time saved trumps the newsroom goal of time spent. Very interesting premise. And so this is what it looks like. It's updated constantly, and it gives you short takes of stories. It is basically very raw meat, but it's also customized. And then we come to what I think is probably the one most important takeaway here, the rise of the mobile editor. Uh, this will be the next critical job. This is a job that you don't hear much about. It's not advertised properly, because the people who need to recruit them don't know what they're looking for. But this person is a curator of news, is a person who understands multimedia presentations uh, to be presented on a mobile app or a website, and the whole idea of curating in a hurry for an audience that thrives on frequent interruptions. If you were to ask me if I were a student here, I would be trying to become the best mobile editor that I could because everyone will be looking for someone like this. And I have a quote here from, a quote from uh, Corey Bergman, who was the founder of Breaking News. The best mobile curators for us are fast, great news judgment, Twitter junkies, tight and bright writers, social sleuth. And from David Ho, who is editor for mobile for tablets and emerging technology at the Wall Street Journal, the job often involves making sure that graphics and images are mobile friendly. It could be about working with developers, designers, and product folks on setting a direction and helping create new news experiences. And one aside from me, uh, design is a component here. If I had to write a job description for a mobile editor, I would like for that person uh, to not only be a good curator of news, to understand journalism in the traditional sense of the word, but at the same time, this has to be a visual thinker because you are presenting information to people who are very much visually motivated. So you would like to have a mobile editor who may not be a designer, but understands design and can articulate how design works in these mobile platforms. Circa is the second one that I like to profile. He has editors who rework the top stories of the day into bite-sized, they call them atomic units of information. Quotes, photos, maps. Sometimes a story comes in the way of a quote. Sometimes it comes in the way of a map. I remember since the 1980s, we have always been saying, what is the best way to tell the story? Well, let's not fool ourselves in here. The best way to tell the story for 95% of the editors I ever encountered in 700 projects in 120 countries is a headline and a story. <laughs> Sorry to say that. And they believe that their mission in life is to protect the words. Of course the words are important. I am a journalist before I'm anything else. But at the same time, sometimes, Two quotes and a map are going to tell in a mobile devices what happened with the latest in the search of that uh, Malaysian airliner. That you already know the story. So two quotes and a map will tell me where the search was today and what two experts say. You don't need to say anymore. That is the kind of, of curating and the kind of training that I would like for mobile editors to have. Circus does that. You can see what it looks like. Very appealing, very interesting, and Sometimes you see a quote, sometimes you see a map, and you get short bites of information. Soon, coming soon, will be Cartoon Network anything. You could not imagine that Cartoon Network will go into this, but just like everybody else, they are joining. Cartoon Network will release an app later this year that will deliver original 15-second content bites, videos, games, polls, and trivia. It's only for mobile devices, and the company uh, has announced this a, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think that this will be one way of providing some entertainment, which will be the next phase of these. Features and entertainment will be the next wave 
for mobile devices. Right now, we're very much into what's news. But I always say there's a 14-year-old in a junior high school somewhere who will be so hooked to a telephone that he or she will be reading feature stories, longer pieces, and so on on these devices. We have to be prepared for that. Google Glass. We're a little bit into the science fiction right now, but not really. The latest news and notifications right next to your eye. It could be a headline only. It might be uh, something very brief. And then there are the smart watches. I have been in Switzerland in the last few weeks, and the Swiss watchmakers are not sure that this will take off. But Apple and Samsung are. And so this will be updates on your wrists. You have to think in terms of James Bond or Dick Tracy, perhaps. But we will be turning here maybe to read the headlines of the day. And this, some say, is already beginning to happen. And the experiments are taking place there. So that will be uh, the next item to, uh, to add to the media sextet by then. So now we come into what is more recent. This is now that we've seen who is doing the constant flow of information, the harbor light. Now we go into the curated, discrete editions, carefully crafted words and images, complex multimedia storytelling, deeper perspective, and longer time frame. This is closer to the journalism that we're used to, where you take your time and you meditate over the content and you have more time to prepare visuals and more time to, to take the design and the writing and the editing together. In 2010, when the first iPads came out, the first project that I had dealing with a tablet was the Gulf News in Dubai. And I'm very proud to say that at that time, n we were not thinking curated. But my first prototype for them was basically to do morning coffee, the lunch partner, and the going home edition. And of course, uh, the resources were not there to do this three times a day. I still believe that in 2014, these are the key times, and now we know it better than in 2010, to do this. Uh, if you think, if there are people here old enough to remember the world of American newspapers of another era, American newspapers were doing this. I cut my teeth at the Miami Herald and the Miami News, uh, first as an intern, and that's my first job there. And I can tell you that we had two or three morning editions, and at lunch in Miami, the Miami News would provide a lunch edition. What was that like? Eight pages, mostly photos, because we knew that people were going to grab a sandwich, sit under the palm tree. They would not want to read too much, flip the pages and look at photos. Who arrived in Miami at the airport before noon today? And so that was the launch edition. And then we had the evening edition. So there was a sense of key times way back then. And this is the idea with these mobile premises, that people want at certain times for the world to stop and somebody to tell me, if you only want to know four stories, what are they? Most recently, as in the last week, the New York Times new product is NYT Now, which features headlines and short summaries, taking readers then to full Times articles. This is the raw meat, and then if you know more, you will find the ultimate steak. Uh, morning and evening briefings and lunchtime and evening reads. Links to stories in NYT Now, and the editors find that these stories are interesting, and then they put them there for you to browse through. Very clean, very uh, good product, and notice how personal. I would never imagine that the New York Times would put his arm around me and tell me good morning in a million years. <laughs> it's happening. It's amazing what desperation can do sometimes. You know? But I like this. I like that in this particular device, this device is close to you, so you need to have this closeness. Uh, talking about teddy bears, there is a teddy bear here. Then there is Yahoo News Digest that two times a day, I get updates there, and I'm very happy to see it. This one selects stories for the digest using a combination of algorithms and human editors, and sends you a push notification when your digest is ready. I, as I said, I look forward to this. There is a lot of wire copy in here, but when you get it in your hands, and for about two or three minutes, which is the most that they will give you on these devices at a given time, 
you get updated and you feel secure that you know what's happening in the world. It has a very slick magazine-like look, and the moment you see the first picture, again, you know what's happening. It could be a rainy snow day in New York, whatever it is, the main story in five seconds flat, you know what the editors have for you. The Guardian's um, number open 001 is a printed newspaper but with stories selected by an algorithm based on what people are sharing. Uh, this was the original version. Again, this is printed, but they are going to base this on the stories that are most shared by people. In Brazil, O Globo O Mais became the first iPad exclusive edition in the evening in Brazil. And one of the good things about it is that it was one of the first tablet editions not to try to look like a newspaper, which is a big mistake. A tablet should not look like a newspaper. It is not a newspaper. And so here you have the, uh, the best of, of how to present a tablet edition, which is a navigation with images. Look at the images and click and go. Esquire Weekly, one of my favorites, when an iconic monthly turns weekly. And here we have the issue of frequency, which if you ask me in my consulting work, this is another one of the most difficult things to break in the mind of editors of a certain age. An editor of a newspaper lists from 5 a.m. to 5 a.m. The editor of a magazine, a weekly magazine, from week to week, Monday to Monday or Friday to Friday, a monthly once a month. You have to erase those notions of frequency totally because even if you are a daily, you're going to be putting your brand out there 10 times a day, 15, 15 times a day. And so Esquire Weekly is a representative of that. What they've done is to select Again, curating material that they present in there, and some of them are stories that are in the makings for, for the monthly version of Esquire, but you bring them in there. So they have broken away from the pattern that we are a monthly, and here you have Esquire Weekly. The Atlantic Weekly, it's a highly curated, lean back experience to let the mind roam. Also very attractive, very easy to follow, but a totally lean back experience selecting the best of the Atlantic monthly and presenting it weekly. I imagine it was not easy for these people to abandon their notions of frequency and move in a different direction. And then we come to a project very dear to us that we're doing right now as we speak. Parry Match, as you know, is, is one of the most iconic magazines of Europe. It's been there for 75 years, weekly. And they produce on a weekly basis a type of covers you see. It's a combination of very good photography in the style of Life magazine of the 1950s in this country. Uh, great, they have journalists with great reportages uh, on Afghanistan, Syria, but then a heavy dose of beauty, celebrity, and so on. These are their most recent covers, but they are iconic for introducing Brigitte Bardot to the world. The story has it that Brigitte Bardot, when she was 19, as you see her here, went just as a model, you know, gotten from an audition, and she posed on the top, on the roof of the Paris Match building, and the rest was history. She doesn't look like that now. She doesn't allow herself to be photographed, but she has become an icon because Paris Match introduced her to the world. So here we are. We are, I've redesigned this magazine twice in the print edition. And then I am called there to take a look at it for the third time. But the job is to take a look at Perry Match and change it typographically again. But all the time I am thinking, you know, at my age, I want to make sure that uh, I don't do things that I have done before. Changing the typeface is fun. Been there, done that. Let's rethink the product. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a daily mini edition of Perry Match? Why not? But we are a weekly. We've never done that. So the thinking begins to change. In the life of a newspaper, in the life of a magazine, and I have lived in many, the most interesting things are usually not reported. It's the exchange between two editors. And that funny exchange turns into a boring headline and a boring story. But the original conversation about the story was interesting. So in the life of this magazine, you have celebrities going through there. They have a photo studio. There are photo shoots. But they live from week to week. A photo shoot is done, and there will be 10 pages of James Franco in next Monday's 
very much. But you have a hundred photos. He was here. So if you had a 6 p.m. edition on the phone, wouldn't it be fun to say James Franco was here today, here are three of the photos, and we have the big story coming up. And so we began to develop this with our art director who is here, Reed Reipstein, who is my co-pilot and right-hand man. And uh, so we began to do this. Why not get an advertising to sponsor this? So on this day, this will be at 6 p.m. And what would you have? You will have some headlines because you want to know, you want your teddy bear, what's happening in the world. You will have some of the photos and the stories that are passing through. You might have on this day is an attack on a shopping mall in Kenya. So you have five or six photos of that. Very photographic because it's 6 p.m. It's Paris. Maybe I'm reading this on the train on the way home. And I am not going to give you much time. But you're presenting a mini version of this magazine on the phone. And then at the end, I am a firm believer that you want, just like in the movie, the satisfaction that this is finished now. You can go on and do what you were going to do. So who worked on this edition today? The credit lines. But it's really thinking of a magazine of 200 pages and narrowing it down to three minutes. And we have to think that way. When we're thinking digital, it's not just thinking of learning how to code or HTML. Right now, for journalists, it is a way of thinking. It is a philosophy. It is a different approach to what we know how to do very well. Because what you have here is nothing new. It's photos. You have a photo editor. It's videos. Well, you take some of the stories and do a short video. It is telling stories in a different way with a different frequency for a medium that everybody has there. And for this brand, the average person reading this magazine is perhaps a 55 or 60-year-old someone. Their children would not probably get near it. But if you mention the name Perry Match, everybody knows it. So it's putting the brand that is known in the hands of people who would not touch it in its current state. And that has been successful for us to be able to influence them. Every news organization needs to think in terms of frequency and in terms of how their philosophy of presenting and delivering news works. And then, of course, there's print. I am a firm believer that you can do print happily. But in order to do that, you have to give up on the idea that print is king and print is the protagonist. Print is part of the media quartet, but it is not the king of the media quartet. If you had to ask me who is the king, the phone. The smartphone is where the action is, and it's where the action will be. And you have to learn how to write for that medium, how to design for that medium, how to create new products for that medium. And your advertisers need to be attracted to that medium as well. But I have been, most recently, involved with this paper in, in Norway, Afton Posten, which I think represents the ultimate in doing print happily. And sometimes um, you have to depend on an editor who wants to do this. The editor, the new editor of this newspaper is a man who did not romance print because he came from a digital environment. That is very unusual. When you make the editor of the newspaper someone who had no background in printed newspapers. We're going to see more of that. So because there are no romance, they're not romancing print. They come in there and they see print as a necessity, but they don't see print as the ultimate essential item. And so his first move, we changed the logo to make it more digitally minded so that that circle could go in all of the digital devices. The main stories are always what we call invisible stories. This is story, the one, the handcuffed person in there is the guy who massacred so many, the, the so-called blonde angel, who went into a summer camp with students in a, in a political sort of summer camp and killed many. So this story is they had an exclusive. He's in total isolation, an interview with him. How does he feel to be in this isolation? But it was an invisible story, invisible because he did not break out of jail. This is a story that is lying down there, and those are the stories that do very well in the lean back mode. And of course, it was the cover story here. They are in more lifestyle stories. The print edition is not pretending to break news. It's not pretending to be anything but a lean back version. And they have 220,000 copies that are printed every day. So this is a, this is a paper 
that does all of this extremely well. The redesign came out March 19th. Follow it. You don't have to know Norwegian, to know, but their um, digital components are very much right here and now. And that's the slogan of the editor. It's not what will happen six hours from now. He keeps telling a newsroom of mostly print-driven people. It is what is happening now. And we want to update online the photograph of the Ukrainian crisis. We don't want the photo of two hours ago. It must be the one of five minutes ago. Right now is the, is the motto. But for print, a more relaxed environment, you know. Uh, 20 good ways to become rich in Norway, whatever. And those are very lean back experiences in the digital, in the mobile, very actively and very news driven. And of course, is the media quartet. What you find here at the end of the day is a paper in print that rather than being eliminated or killed, has been revitalized and given it a new role. And then the real news, breaking news, is in these uh, devices that you see there. Uh, the next step for us is to work on a tablet edition curated for the evening. The Scandinavians, I repeat, are usually ahead of the pack. They were the first to be making money with all of this, and they really are miles ahead of the rest in how they present news across the media quartet. So take a look at what they do. And only two weeks ago, a new newspaper was born in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Register. Uh, many are wondering why would anybody start a printed newspaper uh, now? But they did, and this publisher, this young publisher did, and I wish them well. And who said that extra editions were not around anymore? On the day that Gabriel Garcia Marquez died, El Tiempo of Colombia put out an extra edition of eight pages, extra, extra. And it was, I mean, it's a collector's item, gone. They told me that they could have printed 50,000, 100,000 more copies. This is reason to celebrate. This is reason to celebrate. But it also takes editors who know how to jump at this. Part of the reason, and I can say that on the record and off the record, that so many American newspapers are lagging behind is because many of their editors are waiting for them to die. And if that's what you do, if a doctor comes into the room in the morning taking the pulse to see the patient survive the night, that patient is not going to survive. You have to do print happily. You have to give it its place. You have to believe that there is still room to do extras, that people love their contact with papers like this. But they do it happily, and they seize the occasion, and nobody sits there to think, oh, who would want to see an extra on paper? They do it. That is great storytelling, and I think that that's the reason for uh, rejoicing. And if you like paper, how about the little printer here? Uh, I was just introduced to this by, by Reed. This little printer uh, is created so that if you really want to print anything out of you, this is from The Guardian, right, Reed? On the right, The Guardian. If you want to print what you see, there you go. Print it and take it somewhere. Why not? So I'm going to give you the six takes, takeaways and then um, answer your questions. First of all, make sure that you have a clear philosophy in place for the flow of a story, how it evolves from the first tweet to a retrospective analysis. And you have to do this in the newsroom. Again, in the Scandinavian newsrooms, we do these drills. I have been involved in drills where you say, okay, the tunnel in the city is blocked. There has been a terrorist attack. Well, how do we react in the newsroom? Who puts out the first tweet? Who is in charge of that? These tasks must have a name and a face or they don't happen. If you're going to be in the plane in the media quartet, you have to know who is in charge of the raw meat, who is in charge of cooking the steaks, and what happens in between. So I think that that's the first one. You must have a clear philosophy of how your organization reacts to breaking news from the first tweet to a retrospective analysis. Number two, consider curated digital editions which can allow for a different editorial perspective along with a clear start and end for users. It is very important, no matter how small you are, that at least once a day you have an editor who gives your audience what your editor considers to be the top five stories of the day. This is essential to your survival. And this now is a choice. In about two years from now, it will be a requirement. And you will have to do this. So start training people to do this. In a perfect world, you will do it in the morning, 
and in the evening. In a more perfect world, you will do it three times a day. Curate, make people become addicted and dependent to the fact that you are there as a guardian angel to provide that little teddy bear that says, we're telling you what you should be talking about. And they are different. In the morning is, you're headed for work. What should I know before I have a discussion with someone at work? At lunchtime, you've been occupied for three hours. This is what's happening. In the evening, what will I do tonight? Maybe an element. What is the best program on television? So you have to accommodate this curated addition to the time of day. Number three, mobile is certainly extraordinary for breaking news. But consider curated editions as well. With both, keep it short and sweet. Do print happily, connecting the dots for readers. Print is no longer the protagonist, but give it a place within the media quartet. Number five, today's environment is not conducive to solo numbers. Emphasize interdisciplinary teams, bringing design, technology, business, and editorial together to conceive products. There cannot be any good journalism done today without a marriage to technology, because that's the way it is. I mean, that could be a course in itself, but that is the way it is. The days when the, all, the, old thing, the only technology that an editor would have to know is the color capacity of the printing press, those days are over. You have to have an understanding about technology in terms of how you deliver information, at least basic information. You have to have, in a perfect world, the editor, the advertising person, and the technology person having daily meetings. There is no room for solo numbers. It is all about teams. And finally, number six, the industry needs well-trained mobile editors who can tell stories across platforms. And in fact, I believe that two years from now, a person who can work across platforms won't find a job in media anywhere in the world. These are the best of times to be a storyteller. How can they not be? When I have people my age again who tell me, lament, I say, there is nothing to lament. I wish I was 29 years old because now you can tell stories better. I'm having a ball. I hope you will do the same. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, if you have questions, you will have to walk around. We have only one mic here, and you will be on camera. So if you have a question, please come over here, and I'll be very happy to answer questions for you. OK? No, you have to come here, otherwise I cannot hear you, and, and we are online, so we want to make sure that the rest of the world hears your question. Hi, I'm Serena Patel from the class of 99. Um, you explained a lot about how you're using the apps and the tablet. Uh, how does what you put on your app each day connect with what you're putting on Facebook and Twitter? Are you using the same material, and is your audience being diluted or how are you connecting well, the I app think that, to the yeah, social the, media? You take some of the same messages that you're putting there, the essence of the stories that you're putting there, and you tweet the content and you tweet, you also put it there for, for Facebook. But it's basically, you know that you have a certain audience with social media. So there are people who, when these stories are posted, already have prepared the tweet and the Facebook entry. And it's there to seduce you and to tease you into what the stories are. But is your audience much bigger on your app versus on your Facebook page? I don't, I don't, I don't know. It depends from publication to publication, okay. I would say. I would say that once you go into Twitter and Facebook, you are expanding your audience considerably. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Eddie, any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Hi, I'm Sydney Beveridge, uh, class of 08 slash 09. And um, yeah, I was curious, especially what, what, what have you found in, in your work to be sort of the ideal relationship between, I guess, media makers and the audience? I guess, and, and particularly, I guess I'm thinking of like interactive elements in stories, whether they be in the online platforms or whatnot. And then also maybe just sort of conversations between the audience and, and and readers and yeah. writers, yeah. Yeah, this, this is, a, is a good question because particularly with mobile devices, your audience wants to engage with you. And one of the things I always say, which makes people laugh, but it's true, is that when you're designing for the tablet or the, or the mobile, you have to design for the brain, for the eye, and for the finger. The finger wants something to do. You want to interact. You want to maybe write a comment. 
connect with the writer in some way. And I think that this is also difficult for the journalist to, to include in their repertoire. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, are there times when it's sort of too, I guess they're figuring out the balance when it's not encroaching on the journalist, but it's engaging the audience? Like trying you have to, to you know, again, we are at the beginning of all of this. Mm -hmm. So many times, I think the problem is getting the journalist to provoke this kind of interaction more so than the other way around. I don't think we have a lot of situations when there is too much provocation of the reader. There is more, why don't we engage the reader, ask a question, and so on. Uh, yes? You have to come here, I'm sorry, because otherwise uh, you will not be on the... Uh... I'm Gabrielle Pasco. I'm from the class of 99, and even in the short time that I've been back for this reunion this weekend, there have been myriad discussions among my classmates about not just what not just the way we're telling stories across platforms, which I have to compliment you, you did a really wonderful job of summing up some beautiful ways to tell stories in new media, but I think a lot of us are struggling from my class with what this, with reconciling what we know to be the right way to tell stories and facing the barriers that exist in the economics of telling stories in an age when people are willing to give away for free what a lot of us have staked a, a claim into to doing for pay. Um, when you're putting together your storytelling models, um, can you address sort of how, what the economics are and what, how you factor that into the models you've developed for, te for storytelling in this, in this era? Well, this is a tough question because, you know, a lot of these companies are struggling with the same. However, as I said, a lot of my work today is in Europe and with Scandinavians, and the Scandinavian companies have managed to, to, to begin to break through those barriers more so than, than the Americans. In other words, most of these newspapers already had paywalls, and they were not given things for free. You could get five stories for free, and after that, You've got to pay up. So I think that the Americans, in a sense, are behind this. But it is a tough question that everybody is struggling with because good journalism is expensive to produce. And all, of, all that we're talking about here is even more expensive to produce if you think that you are a multimedia story requires four or five people. I mean, when you look at the New York Times or the Washington Post, the credits sometimes include nine or ten people. You have producers. You have a videographer, you have a photo editor, a researcher, and two or three people involved. So it is not inexpensive journalism to do, and yet it's a catch-22 because you must be engaged in that type of journalism. So I wish I had a better answer. Yes? Hi, I'm Rick Zednick, class of 94, and I want to actually pick up on the same theme. Um, as a consultant, you have to sell your own services and convince the, your clients that they're going to have a return on the investment that they invest in you. So the things you're talking about when you talk about a media quartet, you're asking people to invest in four platforms or others perhaps. What, is the, what can an editor do in talking to the business side, as you suggested? They all need to be having these conversations together to develop products. What can the editor do to help the business side see the business case for investing in a consultant who's going to help them say that they're going to have a quartet, a media quartet, that they're hopefully all going to make money one way or another? Well, most of the, them already have some form of a quartet in operation by the time we arrive in some cases, uh, like in Perry Match, the phone was not existent and it will be now. And so I think that what I always work very closely with the notion of advertising. I have always believed that you need to have advertisers around you. And in every one of these projects, one of the first things we do is how would we incorporate advertising as part of the storytelling process here? And I think that sometimes the editors, as you can imagine, are not interested and say, well, we will do a prototype first. You don't do a prototype without advertising because you know that it will not be realistic. So in my case, not only because I want to get paid, but uh, simply because you want this to be successful and this will be in the hands of people. So, and it is a new product, so you have to create the prototypes with the advertisers that you would like to attract. You can't go to an advertiser and suggest a 6 p.m. edition 
or the magazine on the phone. They have no idea what that is. So you've got to build. And so we at Garcia Media, we are very much in tune with this and with native advertising. And the fact that these disciplines are blending, that you do a lot of storytelling in advertising, and you begin to get them excited about this, is not uh, the old idea that advertising is a box with an X at the bottom of the page. You don't even know what the ad is. It is basically contemplating that in the future, advertising is going to have more of a marriage with, uh, with the editorial side without you know, compromising uh, journalistic ethics or anything like that. But that is a necessary marriage and it's one that the readers like. Users like advertising. They see it as information too. So that's part of what we do, to incorporate advertising from day one in the mix, which makes the advertising directors very open mm. to promoting these projects. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, Andy Pergam, uh, 2001, since we're all sharing. Um, a, a question for you about, you know, I, I'm totally with you on the mobile part, and I, I really like this sort of start and finish idea. I, I wanted to, and, and I agree, mobile's where it's going, and, and print is not dead. I wanted to talk about the part in the middle, the desktop and, and laptop and, and the web, and which to me seems to be uh, you come in sideways to a story, so it's not a, a clear start, and it's infinite scroll, which is what everyone's been talking about for the last couple of years and sort of the direction things have gone. So I'm, I'm curious how you square that up, or is it dying too? Well, you know, I, in, uh, sometimes when I am flying and I am 35,000 above the clouds, I, I begin to think that everybody talks about the poor newspaper, the printed newspaper, how it's suffering. I think that the, the online, the PC is basically like the middle child in a family. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, <laughs> there is a baby, and the middle child is the one with a trauma, going to the therapist, uh, abandoned, <laughs> and I think that is what is happening mm -hmm. in that case. But there are still PCs around, except that most people are reading online news on their mobile devices. Mm. So I don't know what will happen there, but I still have them in the media quartet. I haven't made it a trio yet. Right. <laughs> okay. So. Gotcha. Thanks. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm Amy Clark from the class of 2004. Um, I uh, agree with everything you said, um, and especially about the trained web editor, um, mobile editor. Um, but Content management tools and social media tools, they're really easy to use. They're user friendly. Um, so what kind of s skills do you think people should try to cultivate to be a good mobile editor? Because it seems like. Yeah, that is the question. I think that uh, in my class this semester, I think we will probably graduate students. There are some of them in here who will be great mobile editors. So what do they have? They have, first of all, they had uh, another semester of training at Columbia University. So they, they write, they edit, they know exactly what a good story is, and that hasn't changed since I went to journalism school 40 some years ago. So that's requirement number one. You can, nose for news, they used to say. You could smell the news. Um, number two, they understand that the story is more important than the platform that you're not going to go digital first, this first, is the story first. And that once you have a story, that story is going to be delivered through all these various platforms. That's number two. Three, they know how people consume information in these various platforms, and they have had a notion of design. Even though in that class, nobody came in there being a designer, they've had typography, they have space and distance, they've had all of this. And so I think that we have taught them how to be mobile editors. And that group of 14 or 15, I can guarantee you, can get out of there and do it. You know, And they are better because they went to school here. So they already had that background. But we need more courses like it. And we need to incorporate that notion in every class and not my class is an elective. So they came there because it was an elective class and they took it. I think that we're not talking elective territory here. We're talking a class that should be required. Did you hear that, Dean uh, Grunsky? <laughs> All right. So, I mean, that's, that's basically how I see it. I hope I answer your question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, uh, yep. I think it's time for us to move on to, where do we go next? OK. I'll make it tough, just because I'm, I'm, I'm the last one. 
try to make things interesting. So I, I, want, I, I want to believe that it's a great time to be a storyteller. And I'm not a Luddite. I mean, I'm, I'm addicted to, to, to my phone. I check it several times a day. I've written for a website. But something about consuming news on the phone and on the screen leaves me cold, leaves me feeling like I've, I, you know, it's like eating junk food or something. It's, it's somehow not the same sort of viscerally satisfying experience as uh, reading a magazine or a newspaper or a book. And I've never read, I rarely read long form on my phone, and it feels more like a, you know, something that's sort of a crutch mm -hmm. that sort of disengages me from, from life. And I don't, I find myself not wanting to write for it and reading it a lot, but not really enjoying it like I feel like I should enjoy what I read. So I wonder if you have, if you have a response to that. Probably a few therapy sessions would probably Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm alone in that. It's just me. I, I have much more important things to talk to my therapist about. No, I, I, I read you, but you know, and we love readers like this. We absolutely love them, but we must concentrate on the ones who are having the time of their life reading on these mobile devices, I'm sorry to say. But you know, like you, I am much older than you are. I, I love to read uh, on paper, but I know that if we are going to stay in this business, information is going to be presented in other ways, but at the same time, there will be a printed edition. For you, I think the world will continue to do print happily, because yeah. you'll be there to see it. And there are many readers like you, of all ages, even younger than you, who tell us this. But if I get up here and tell you, that we should not write for mobile or not be creating for mobile, I would be doing a disservice to the crowd because I think it's, it's, it's exciting and different and that is where most people are going to be getting their information. Yeah. yeah. Sorry that I couldn't be any better, but if you want three sessions of therapy, I'm available. <laughs> and do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bill, where do we go? Down the hall to the world room, right? Yeah. Okay. So see you there. Pleasure. Huh?